Today, as we go back into Change Makers, or we are staying with Change Makers, you know, last week was Noah. What, what did you hear about Noah? Do you remember Noah? What's the main point? Go against the flow, right? Flood, flow, easy. Today, um, we're going to continue this series. And before I jump into it, do you guys know what a carry is in life? Does anyone know what a carry is? If you're a video gamer, there's a carry on your team sometimes. If you're a basketball player, you know, my brother and I, is my brother here? Yes, with his sons. His sons are amazing basketball players now. And the other, the other day, my brother and I and Edric, we played against my, two, my brother's two kids and, and one of the nephews, uh, I think he was Titus. And we didn't win one single game. <laughs> we couldn't win. But when they're on my team, I'm always excited because we have someone who will carry the team. You know, uh, there's another carry, um, Stephen Carey, Steph Carey. <laughs> Did he carry the team yesterday? No, I'm, and I'm not here to make fun of Golden State. My, my sister lives in California. But the idea is it's nice in life when we have someone who makes a difference. When someone is so good that they can change everything. And today we're going to look at a different kind of change maker. Normally we looked at the change makers. Noah, you know, saved an entire family, built an ark. We, we talked about Gideon. We talked about all these people that do great things. Today we're going to talk about people that impacted one life at a time. And so we are going to go into, into the book of Ruth. And the title today is... Be a change maker, be selfless. It's super simple, super uh, short, and there's three characters, and we'll study each of them. We'll look at Naomi and her perseverance. We'll look at Ruth and her sacrifice, and then we'll look at Boaz and, and the grace he shared. So let us bow our heads again and just open in prayer. Lord, thank you. I pray as I uh, speak today, it is you speaking through me in your Holy Spirit. Will you move in everyone's hearts? Again, thank you for all the moms here, and I pray that we will be change makers as we, we learn together. So thank you, Lord. I pray for everyone watching online as well, um, that you would work in their hearts. So in Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen. So we're going through a lot of material. Some verses, I go super speed fast. But in the beginning of Ruth, we have in Bethlehem two people, Naomi and Elimelech. And there's a famine in the land. What is famine in Tagalog? Pamin. There's, it's not, right? It's tagutom, right? Yes. It's tagutom in the land. And because there's a tagutom, they go to, with their children, they have two children, Chilion and Malon, and they go from Bethlehem to Moab. How far is Bethlehem from Moab? I googled it. And it said 7,770 miles, and that's not right. Because it's trying to get from Bethlehem in Israel to Moab in the Indiana, United States. Of course, that's not where they went. They'll never get there. They were going to, Beth, to Moab uh, down there, if you look at the map, near, near above Egypt. And how far is that? Is it near Egypt? No, above Edom, and, sorry. And how far is it? It's about 50 miles. How long will it take you to walk 50 miles? Any guess? Nowadays, you run a marathon. What's a marathon? 20 something, right? So, so you can do 50 miles in a day. But back then, it took them maybe, um, in Saturday service, someone said two weeks. <laughs> I said, I'm bagal naman, you know, a few steps a day. But it took them about maybe seven, seven days. And they went there because there was a a famine. And what happened when they got there? And was it the right decision, you know? Was it the right decision to leave Israel and, and go to Moab? We'll see. When they were there, first Elimelech dies. So now it's Naomi and her two sons. And then she says, you know, you got to get married because you have to have children because my husband's gone. So, so the only hope now for another, for the line to continue, in, in that time they needed someone it's to have children. So they, they married 
Orpha and Ruth. But then the sons died. So who's left now? You have Naomi, Orpha, and Ruth, and that's it. Just the three of them. And they hear that there is now food in, in the land of Israel, that God is helping his people. So Naomi is left just with her two daughters-in-law, and she decides we, we have to go back. So is this a disaster? Yes, this is pretty much as bad as it gets. If you're a mother back then, you lose your husband and you lose your, your children. There's no one to help anymore. Back, back then, it's a patriarchal society. So she says, let's go back. And they say, no, we're, we're going to stay with you. But she convinces them to go back. And Orpha goes back. And you have left is Naomi and Ruth. And we're going to jump into Ruth uh, chapter 1, verse 6. And it says, she arose with her daughters that she might return from the land of Moab, for she had heard that the Lord had visited his people in giving them food. So she departed with her daughters-in-law, and they were on the way to return. And Naomi said to them, go, go back to your mother's house and listen to what she said. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with me and, and the dead. So she's telling them, don't, don't go with me. It's very interesting, right? She's telling them, go home. And there's a reason. And she says this, may the Lord grant that you might find rest. Interesting. She says what? Each in the house of your husband. So she wants them to get married again. So she said, go home to your family. Let them find you another husband. Then she kissed them and they, they wept. And they said, no, we will stay with you. So they have a good relationship. She said, no, let's stay with you, mom. And Naomi said, no, return. If you stay with me, Will I have sons that they might be your husbands? See, in, in, in the Bible times, if you're a widow, it's super difficult. You need men to work the land, to do the, you know, to earn the living. So if you're a widow, you have no financial capacity, and then your security is your sons. If you're Naomi, you lost your husband and your sons. It's like a double tragedy. So she says, go back. I am too old to have a husband. If I had hope, if I, if I should even have a husband, if someone will still marry and bear sons, will you wait for them until they're grown up? So would you wait for all those years? No, it is harder for me than for you. So she's saying, you still have hope. I do not. Go back. And here's interesting, right? She said, for the hand of the Lord has gone forth against me. What do we see in Naomi's life? A person who has, for right or wrong, made certain choices. And she's looking at her life and she says, it's not good. God is against me. Have you felt that before? Have you prayed prayers and, and done all the stuff and maybe you've made this mistakes and you think, you know, because of what I've done, because I left Israel, I think God's hand is against me. It's a heavy burden to bear. So what does she want to do? I believe she's thinking of her daughter. She said, it is better for you to not be with me. You have a better chance. Find a new husband, find a new life. So they, 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 they cried and Orpha left. And then here's a very interesting passage. Naomi said to Ruth, look, your sister has gone back to her people and her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. It's very interesting. If you are an Israelite, what is the first commandment? You shall have no other gods before me. So why is Naomi telling her daughter-in-law, follow your sister? She has gone back to her people and her gods. I think what we're seeing here is something we struggle with. In life, we know that God is all-powerful and God is good, but when circumstances hit, Sometimes we feel, maybe I need to be pragmatic. Maybe this is the way. And so she's probably thinking, what is the best way to help my daughters-in-law? I can't do anything for them. And if I hope on God, he's against me, just go back. Even if it means going back to your people and your gods. Can you see the compromise she struggles with? So I won't tell you what Ruth says, because that's the next part. But they go until they get to Bethlehem, 
And in Bethlehem, the people say, is this Naomi? And she says, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt bitterly with me. So she, what is Mara? She said, I went out full. My name used to be Mean Delight, but the Lord, she says, who brought me back? It's the Lord. The Lord did this to me. Why do you call me my delight? Since the Lord has witnessed against me and the Almighty has afflicted me. So she says, call me bitterness. This is tough, right? Have you felt this before? And I know when circumstances hit, it is hard. It is hard to remember God's loving and good. And then I have these circumstances. So you see with Naomi, a very human person. And her plan is very human-centered. I send my daughters back because they can find a husband who will take care of them because God is against me. But despite all that happened to her, the reason I want to highlight Naomi's perseverance is she still believed in God. She still said God did this. She still said, I'm going to go back to Israel. She acted in human interests for her children, not godly, so this is, you know, not ideal. She's not perfect. But God still what? God still used her to attract Ruth, and we'll see what Ruth says. So God uses imperfect people. Who is imperfect in this room? Raise your hand. The rest are asleep, but the imperfect ones, right? We know we are imperfect. Welcome to the club. You know, yes, Friday, I, I had to do a um, wake service for a wonderful a young girl named Summer C. And uh, her grandmother is a lady named Elena. Her mother is Naomi, or Noemi, and uh, Patrick. And she has a sister named Skye. She's nine years old. Um, this picture has a crocheted doll. My daughter made that. And, and the last year, we, we visited her. And we prayed for her. And, and, and that was a picture of her last year. And, and I prayed. And her mom and her family and her, her grandma, who's been to CCF for many years, prayed so much. And God has different plans. But here's why I share her story. Um, that's her when she was going through treatment. During the wake, what I heard from everyone is this, that this nine-year-old girl who went through a year or more of difficult therapy that didn't work out, that had nights of crying and pain, she always wanted people to be happy because she kept persevering. And she told her Ate, someday I'm gonna build you a mansion. And the person who shared said, you know, she's helping Jesus prepare a mansion in heaven. You know, when we, when we persevere, sometimes the perseverance isn't until the result, but it's enough to persevere until you see God. And so this nine-year-old has been an example to me of perseverance. I've had a hard four years, I shared with you guys, lots of challenges with business issues like I've never seen before. But when I start to feel sorry for myself and I remember what she's going through, it's amazing how God uses others to change our perspective and bring gratefulness. So I just share, if a nine-year-old can persevere selflessly, we can persevere selflessly through Jesus. Second, the sacrifice of Ruth. So selflessness is not a walk in the park. It is hard. But as we are selfless, what happens? So let's look at Ruth. In Ruth chapter 1, verse 16 to 17, Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you 
or turn back from following you. So she's telling her mom. Remember her mom said, leave. What did she say? Don't, don't let me leave for where you go, what? I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die or I will, be bur- I will die and there I will be buried. Look at this. Thus may the Lord, and she's using Yahweh, God's covenant name, do to me or in worse if anything but death departs you and me. She basically swore an oath <laughs> telling her mother, if I leave you, may God do worse to me. Um, you know, than death, right? So she's basically saying, I will stay with you no matter what. What do you see here? Loyalty and sacrifice. Why is this sacrifice very important? You know, Ruth is a Moab, Moabite. In the Bible times, the Moabites were uh, enemies of the Jews. And there's a verse in the Old Testament. It says, the Moabite can never stand in the assembly. So when she goes back, is she going back to a place where people will say, welcome, Ruth? Where is she going back to? A place where she will be an outsider? She's going back with a widow who has no sons. Will people want to marry a foreigner in Israel? She's basically going back not to get married. She's going back simply to help Naomi, and she says, your God will be my God. That's very powerful. So she's sacrificing. <clears throat> so fast forward, they're back in Israel. So I jumped a few verses. Chapter 2 now. What happens while they're in Israel? Naomi, who loves her daughter, says, oh, no, her daughter, Ruth, who loves her mother, says, let me go and glean. So I want to go get food in the field of someone whose sight I might find favor in. And Naomi says, go my daughter. She had to ask her mother permission because I think her mother-in-law had told her, you have to be careful. You can't go out. If you go to places, you might get hurt. People might attack you because you're a foreigner. And she departed and went and she gleaned in the field. And this is an interesting part. You know, God is mentioned But God is never mentioned as doing this or doing that. It's just people talking about God, right? Naomi says, God this, and and then then Ruth says, your God will be my God. But this is the first time we see something like a ray of hope. You guys like happy stories, right? It says, she happened to come. So by chance, the field she went to, can, can you see how amazing God is? Is the field belonging to Boaz, who is a family of Elimelech. So that's special. Well, we'll get to that in a bit. <clears throat> what is gleaning? In the Bible, uh, gleaning is you go after the harvesters and you pick up the leftovers. And there's a verse in Leviticus. God wants to take care of the poor. So he said, when you reap the harvest of your land, you do not reap to the corners of the field so you don't get everything. You leave part of it, right? Right? In your vineyard, you shall not gather the fallen fruit. So the stuff that falls down, you leave it. Let the needy and the strangers come. And he says, for I am the Lord your God. So God's saying, I care about the outcasts. <clears throat> In our family, my kids, <laughs> they need to learn this. Because they love ramen. You guys like ramen? But not the nice, fancy Japanese ramen. They like the lucky me instant ramen. (laughs) And I, a loving father, allow them to eat it. I don't know why. But here's what happens whenever we have ramen. There's a big bowl of ramen and the ate can never cook enough ramen. Doesn't matter if she does five packs or three packs. They fight all the time over the ramen. She got one scoop, she got two scoops. And then there's nothing left for poor daddy. They don't leave anything for the foreigner, the daddy. The little kids eat all the ramen, and they don't even think, oh, daddy needs some ramen, let's leave some. They scoop all the ramen, and they they sift it until there's nothing but soup left. So daddy just eats soup and egg, because they don't eat the eggs. But we love ramen, right? And uh, God 
said, don't be like that. When you have something, don't be like, you scoop the bottom and walang naiwan, right? Leave, leave stuff for the poor, right? Because God said, there's people that are always needy. So, you know, when you tip in a restaurant, you look, is there service charge? There is. Oi, my service charge na. I don't want to give any because, you, know, you know what I'm saying? If you have means. If you don't have means. But if you have means, be generous, right? So God's saying he wants people to be generous. Sorry. <clears throat> so that's gleaning. So let's look at Boaz. So Boaz comes from Bethlehem, and what does he say to the reapers? May the Lord be with you. Ang bait naman ni Boaz. Do you, like, do you like a guy like Boaz? He says to his reapers, it's the guys who work for him, may the Lord be with you. And they say, may the Lord bless you. So he has, he's a good man. And Boaz said to the servants, he noticed something. This is interesting. Oy, sino yung babae na yan? He said, who's, who, who's that girl? Who's young woman is that? So she's young, she's still young. And the servant in charge says, she is the Moabite. So people know about her who returned with Naomi from the land of Moab. And she said, so they're talking about her, please let me glean and gather. Thus she came and remained from the morning until now. And she has been sitting in the house for a little while. So they're saying, she's been here since the morning. Look what Boaz says uh, to Ruth. Listen carefully, my daughter. Do not go to glean in another field. Remember I said the graciousness of Boaz. We said the, the sacrifice of Ruth and the graciousness of Boaz. I had to make sabay. Because the, the story happens together. He says, do not go to another field. Stay here. Do not go on from this one, but stay with my maids. Boaz, before you think, Boaz saw a, night, a, a pretty girl and he's... He wants something. Boaz has no expectations, and you'll see later. He never expected to see her. He, uh, like, he wasn't going to talk to her again. He basically was just telling her, look, I will take care of you. And you see it here. He says here, look, listen carefully, my daughter. He didn't say, hey, young lady. He said, hey, my daughter. So Boaz feels like he's a father figure. It's like, you know... I think he's, old, he's much older than her, or at least significantly older. And he said, do not go to another field. Let your eyes be on the field with, which they reap and go after them. So he's saying, follow my, my maids. Remember he said, stay with my maids. Be on, follow them. I have commanded the servants not to touch you. This is very important because she could be in danger. So he told all his servants, this girl, she's a foreigner, you leave her alone. And when you are thirsty, you can drink wherever my servants go. So he basically said, you just act like one of my people. And then she fell to her face and she bowed on the ground. Why have I found favor in your sight that you should take notice of me because I am a foreigner? She says, why would you notice me? Look know what Boaz says, all you have done for your mother in law after the death of your husband has been reported. So people talked about her. You know, if you are a person that is selfless, people will know sooner or later. And it was reported, so people are watching her. How you left your father, your mother, the land of your birth, and came to what? To a people, <coughs> sorry, you did not know, may the Lord reward your work and your wages be full from the Lord, the God of Israel. I highlighted this verse, under whose wings you have come to seek refuge. So when Naomi, when Ruth left, the first thing we said is she was taking care of her mother-in-law. But remember she said, your God will be my God. Now it's clear the full extent of her sacrifice. The root of her sacrifice is not just I love my mother-in-law. Boaz said, may the Lord reward you, Yahweh. May your wages be from Yahweh. Look how noble Boaz is. He didn't say, I will take care of you. I will help you. Again, he has no intentions for, for Ruth. But he said, the, Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings 
you have come to seek refuge. So he's telling Ruth, I know why you're really here and why people talk about you being here is because you came here to seek refuge under the wings of God. So Ruth really changed her, her, so to speak, her allegiance from her people and her God to Yahweh, the God Almighty. So this is, Boaz is saying, I know why you're here. And at mealtime, he said, come, that you may eat. Uh, eat with me. So they sat down with the reapers and she served him roast grain and she ate and was satisfied and had some left or she was served grain. And she gleaned and Boaz commanded the servants, let her glean among the sheaves. Do not insult her. It's very interesting. Boaz said to his servants, do whatever she does, don't make fun of her. So you see the, the kindness and also give her extra pull out from the, the grain and bundles and leave it. So leave some extra for her that she may glean. So he didn't even tell her, here, I'll give you something because you're poor. He just told his people, when she goes around, maghulug kayo ng extra. So she can really feel like she's helping her mother. So he's such a gracious man. So she gleaned, and look how long she gleaned. She gleaned until what? When did she glean? Until... Evening, from morning until what? Evening. Is that a fun job to glean? You're basically picking up leftovers all day. You know, nowadays, sometimes we want exciting jobs, right? I need meaningful work. I need fulfillment. So we look at the examples and what do we have? We have TikTokers and, and influencers and we think, wow, what a, what a fun job. But you know, if you are selfless, meaningful work can be an act of sacrifice and it can be meaningful because you are working for people you love. I know many of you in this room, your jobs aren't flashy or fun, but you do it every day. How do you do it? Because one, you're serving God and two, you're loving those who you are providing for. God sees you. And that is meaningful work, and that is selflessness. So Ruth was a hard worker. When she got back, look at what her life did for Naomi. Remember Naomi was saying, God is against me? So she showed her mom what she got, an ephah, it's a lot, it's enough for many days. Naomi said to her, may he be blessed of the Lord who has not withdrawn his kindness to the living and to the dead. Can you see now that Ruth helped Naomi's perspective of God change? Because Ruth was selfless. Ruth went to glean. God happened to guide her to the right field. And when Naomi found out it's the field of Boaz, her heart started to see hope. She got excited. We can bring hope to people who are discouraged, who persevere in difficult times. And you see it here. And Naomi, so we're getting to the last part as I wrap up Ruth. So Naomi, her mother-in-law said, shall I not seek security for you? She said, you know, I don't want you to, to be alone all your life. When I die, you can't just glean all the time. She said, remember Boaz? So naisip ni Naomi, may paraan. Puede si Boaz. You know, I know mothers, when you have daughters, you're thinking, right? Who can my daughter marry? And Naomi is thinking that. And she's like, Boaz, is he not our kinsman? Who, he winnow, you know, winnows barley at the floor tonight. So she told her, let's have a plan. So she went to the threshing floor. So she told her, you do this, okay? You go tonight. And so she did, she went to the threshing floor and she did according to what her mother commanded her. So what did she do? When Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down. And she came secretly and uncovered his feet. Now, if you read many commentaries, the best ones will say there is nothing sexual here. 
And I agree. You'll see what she, what she said. So she uncovers his feet. And it happens in the middle of the night that he was startled. So the man was startled. And he looked, and there's a girl there. And he said, who are you? And she said, I am Ruth, your maid. So spread your covering over your maid, for you are a close relative. She proposed. That's what the plan was. She uncovered his feet, and then when he woke up, he said, who are you? She said, I am Ruth, your maid. Will you, will you be the one who rescues me? Will you spread your cloak over me? It, it's very beautiful, right? Now, singles, <laughs> do we do this today? <laughs> You know, if you're desperate, tonight I know a guy. I'm going to go to his house. I'm going to sneak in his bedroom. I'm going to open the blanket and just wait there. And then when he wakes up, he's like, Ooh, what's this? They're like, I'm single. Will you rescue me? No. I know we laugh. But that's how they did it. You know, that's an example of something they did back then. And my, my children on the way to get today to church, they said, Dad, I don't know why my daughter asked this. She said, do, do girls ever propose to guys? <laughs> You're so young. I don't know why you asked that question. But she asked, and I said, today if you listen to the story, you will hear of a girl who proposed to a guy. So Ruth proposed to Boaz. Now we might think this is rude, but look what my Boaz says. May you be blessed of the Lord you have shown this last kindness. So Boaz said, by you asking me, you are showing great kindness. It's better than what you did before because you didn't go after the young men, whether rich or poor. It's very interesting. And he said, now my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you whatever you ask. For all my people in the city know that you are a woman of excellence. So Boaz said, don't worry. I know what you're looking for. I will figure it out. Before we go on, I'm going to wrap up Ruth. She gave her up her people and her gods to follow the one true God. So she sacrificed. Selflessness is sacrifice. Secondly, she worked very hard. Hard work is selfless sacrifice. She Ew, before we do that, was obedient regarding matters of the heart. This is a tough one. Today, it's very challenging. We just want to do what our hearts want. And you know, Ruth apparently was an attractive young woman. Why? Boaz said, you can go after young, young men. But she didn't. And Boaz said, this is a great kindness. Boaz was, you know when a person has a condescending view of themselves. I think Boaz is saying, I'm an older man. I'm not your type anymore. But by, by, by asking me to redeem you, you are showing great kindness. So, before we talk about Boaz, the gracious redeemer, I would like to invite our testimony sharers, um, Ardi Roberto and Miriam Kimbao Roberto to come forward. Please give him a round of applause. Let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story, those he redeemed from the hand of the foe. My name is Ardi Roberto. And my name is Miriam Kiambao Roberto. And, and this, this is, is our, our story. story. I'll always remember that September day 29 years ago when God used Ting Ting, my ex-girlfriend who would later on become my first late wife, to bring me to a CCF Bible study in Makati. I was a 29-year-old entrepreneur, writer, and playboy publisher wannabe who was depressed and broke fresh from a failed business venture. At the Bible study, God's word became alive to me like never before. When the gospel was shared, I received Christ as my Lord and Savior, and that turned out to be Ting Ting's answered prayer. Ting Ting and I got married a year later, but after five years, she was diagnosed with life-threatening lupus and almost died in the hospital. 
Miraculously, God healed Ting Ting, and she lived lupus-free for 10 years. But then in 2012, the lupus came back with a vengeance, and after six months of intensive care, Ting Ting took her last breath as I held her in my arms. So I became a widower at the age of 47, a single parent with a five-year-old son named Josh. And every time I would grieve and eat tears for breakfast, God would comfort me saying, Anak, don't be sad. You will love again. I'm going to give you one more great love. And it's true, you know, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit because the Lord also used my son to encourage me on my 48th birthday after blowing the candles of my cake, Josh went up to me and told me, Dad, I wish that God will give you a new wife so that I can have a new mom. And the God of the universe answered Josh's prayer and matched us with, I was on top of the world after I came home from the Miss Universe pageant in 1999, winning the first runner-up title. Shows, endorsements, and awards followed, but in the middle of the limelight, I found myself still searching for meaning and happiness. I thought marriage and starting a family of my own will do that. So when my Italian boyfriend proposed, I said yes and left everything to be with my new husband in Hong Kong. One day, I found myself staring out at the edge of my hotel balcony in another country. My marriage with my Italian millionaire husband was on the rocks. That afternoon, a voice told me, jump and all the problems of the world will end. But then there was another voice, a much gentler one, and I know it was the voice of the Spirit who said, if you kill yourself, that's not love. And love was what I was truly looking for. I stepped back and chose to live another day. However, after two and a half years of marriage, my husband asked for a divorce and eventually married a younger woman and had a child with her. What I thought was forever was now over, so I asked God to end my life. Back in Manila, anxiety, depression, and suicidal thoughts continued to plague me for a couple more years until I came to the love and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. I realized that the only way out was to go back to the God of my youth, that was Jesus. But I realized that outside of my religion class, I didn't really know him, so out of desperation, I prayed, Jesus, I want to know you more. When I opened my eyes, a friend of mine at that very moment sent me a chat message on Facebook. She said, Miriam, what are you doing on Monday? I said, why, what's up? I thought she was going to invite me to another party. And she said, do you want to go to Bible study? The D group leader then shared with me this promise in Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. I held on to God's promise of hope and surrendered my life to Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior. He healed my heart and he made me whole. He restored my relationship with my parents, opened new doors in my career, and gave my life a new direction. He has redeemed my life completely. Having been in and out of several relationships in the past, praise God, I decided to just focus in growing in an intimate relationship with Jesus and committed to be single and pure as I wait for God's chosen best for me. A pastor friend of mine, my co-host at the 700 Club Asia, encouraged me, focus on Jesus, do his work, and he will bring the man to you. As I grew and served the Lord, as I focused on my relationship with Christ, God brought me his best, my Boaz. Three weeks shy of my 38th birthday. Praise God. Praise God. Three weeks shy of my 38th birthday, I blew the candles of my surprise birthday cake and wished for a second chance in my love life. At that very moment, God surprised me even more with a, with a whisper in my heart. That whisper was a name, and that name was Artie. A month later, Artie reached out, 
and on our first date, he told me, I want to let you know that I like you. I want to get to know you because my intention is to marry you. Nine months later, Artie and I were married. Praise God. Praise God. Looking back during those times of grief, whenever God would comfort me and say that I would love again, I would ask him, Lord, why do I need to get married again? Kota na ako, 17 years. But God's answer surprised me. Your, your remarriage is not just for your happiness. It goes beyond you. It is for generations. It is for my glory. And true enough, God has been showing us how this very unlikely love story, our marriage and ministry together, is being used for His glory and His purposes. It's been almost 10 years since we got married, but our love story of God's redemption and second chances continues to reach so many people through our past TV interviews, vlogs, and our books, all for God's glory. And God has also blessed and redeemed our family life. Apart from Joshua, our son with his first wife, God has also blessed us with not just one, but two miracle pregnancies, one at the age of 43 and another at the age of 46. Praise God. But wait, there's more. <laughs> In the midst of the pandemic, as, as I asked God about providing for a better environment for my family, God led us to move to Boracay. And although we planned it to be a year-long sabbatical or rest, God led Miriam and I instead to start our D groups called Island Soul Sisters and Boracay Soul Brothers. And later on, plant a house church or house fellowship, CCF Boracay, where we believe God is working to redeem the island for Christ. Shout out to our CCF Boracay brothers and sisters. You know, truly, as Proverbs 19.21 says, many are the plans in a man's heart, but it's God's purpose that prevails. And in another surprise, God moved so that I was elected as a parent-teacher association president of Joshua School in Boracay. And then the next day, elected as the chairperson of the federated PTA of the entire Malay, overseeing 32 schools and over 13,000 students. And praise God, because the Lord is using my position to launch the Elevate Hashtag Not Alone program to the youth of Malay Aklan for Christ. Please, Please continue to pray for us as God continues to write our story of redemption and as we oversee CCF Boracay. Remember that whatever challenge or life situation that you're going through, God will show up and redeem your life with hope, purpose, and joy. God, God is, is faithful. faithful. Be, Be a, a change, change maker. maker. I'll pray for you. Wait, wait. Stay there. You know, um, because of my problems, I was at Boracay for an event with some people, and they were at the same restaurant. What was it? Dos, That's a, Dos Mestizos. And they were with a couple who wanted to get married, but couldn't get a hold of, you know, whatever. So we talked. They actually ambushed me there in Boracay. And because of them, I ended up going to Boracay about a month and a half ago. And when I was in Boracay, I spoke at CCF uh, Boracay, the best church plant. <laughs> Who wants to be a missionary to Boracay? Me! Anyway. <laughs> and, and we shared the gospel together at that service. A friend came by. And after that, that's when we started talking about their life story. I had never heard their life story. But I already knew I was speaking on Ruth. And the moment I heard their life story, I said, hey, maybe you can come to Manila on May 14. And here they are today. Amazing how God like moves all these crazy events. So let's pray for them. <clears throat> Our Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for RD and Miriam and your story of redemption in their life. Thank you, Lord, for the example they are to us of how you are never done and how you are working every day until we see you to do greater and mightier things and that your love is evident. So Lord, I pray a blessing on them, their three children, and the church plant in Boracay and the, the Elevate ministry, they, they're helping to drive there. Will you work mightily? Will you be glorified? Will you bless them with health, bless them with um, provision, and just take care of all that they're doing so that you would be made known and that this story of redemption will continue all to your glory. Thank you for them. You know the needs they have, the requests they have in their heart. We pray for that as well. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Oh, yes. Yes. Said they'll treat me to real ramen. <clears throat>
So before we uh, uh, wrap up, or as we wrap up, you can see we don't have to have a perfect life because we have a perfect God. And we'll, we'll just look at the grace of Boaz in closing. So where we are, and my brother, uh, one of my brothers reminded me, please tell the singles you don't recommend the girls proposing to the guys. So I'm just reminding the ladies. Sometimes, you know, there's, there's no rules. It's just, it's nice to let the guy lead because you want a man who's a leader. So just remember that, ladies. So to my daughters, I see you both. You cannot be the one to propose. All right. <clears throat> Let's look at Boaz. But hey, if a lady proposes, right, the Bible doesn't say anything. It's not a sin. So please don't quote me the other way also. So Ruth 3. Um, this is, we're in the wrong verse, but 12 and 13. I want you to see something about Boaz. What did he say? Now it is true. I am a close relative. However, there is a relative closer than I. This is so important. You know, if you are Boaz and you are older and you realize this young lady wants you to redeem her and you're shocked because you never expected her to go to you. In Boaz, you know, I think Boaz was excited. But Boaz didn't say, let's get married tomorrow. What did he say? He said, it is true. I am, I am someone who can redeem you. But there is someone closer. What do we see about Boaz? Compare to Naomi. Naomi is, hey, Boaz is the guy because you've, you've seen him. Let's, let's go to Boaz. Remember, Naomi, go home to your, to your father, your family, and get married and, and follow your gods. Naomi is pragmatic, shortcut style. But what is Boaz? Hey, let's do it God's way. Remain this night, so wait. You know, it's late. When morning comes, he wants to assure her. Look how loving, kind he is. In the morning, if he will redeem you, it's good. Let him. But if he will not, I will do it as the Lord lives. So he, he makes a promise. He basically swears, I will do it if the other guy will not. Lie down until morning. You know what he's telling her? Just relax. You know, ladies, sometimes you're stressed, right? This is the kind of man, right? I got it covered. I'm going to do what God wants. I will do it God's way. If there's another guy, God will do it. This guy will work. But if not, I'm there. I'll be the guy. So, so noble, so amazing, so gracious. And then, uh, this is, the, this is war, uh, I just wanted to give you guys some background on, on the Redeemer. If a fellow countryman becomes so poor that he has to sell his property, this is like the family of Limelech, then his nearest kinsman is to come and buy back what his relative has sold. So God always made a provision for the poor never to be left alone. So there is a Redeemer. Everyone has a kinsman Redeemer, and they will find who the, who the next in line is to redeem the family. <clears throat> when she came to her mother-in-law, so Naomi said, how did it go? Kumusta? What happened last night? Tell me the story. She told her everything. And then she said, you wait, because the man will not rest until it is settled today. That's a man, right? She says, he said it, you just relax. He will not rest until he has found you a redeemer or he becomes the redeemer himself. So Boaz, as we close, this is, you know, he's going to do the plan. So he goes to the gate, he finds the relative, and he says, will you redeem Elimelech's family? And the relative says, I will. Because he's thinking business. Yes, I will buy the land. There's no famine now. God has been here. I'm going to buy it. But look at Boaz. Pare. If you buy the field of Naomi, you must also what? Acquire Ruth, and he makes it clear, the outsider, the Moabite. 
The widow, so he's telling her, you going to buy the land? You want the business deal? You're going to get the wife who's a widow, who's an outsider, the widow of the deceased in order because you have to raise up the name of the deceased on his inheritance. You have to have children with her. What does the relative say? I cannot because it would jeopardize my inheritance. Redeem it for yourself and you may have my right of redemption for I cannot redeem it. So the relative says, oh, in that case, I cannot do it. Something will, it'll endanger me. So Boaz, who is also going to suffer these, what does it call us here? The endangering, jeopardizing my inheritance. Boaz says to the elders, you are witnesses today that I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Chilean and Malan. So I'm buying it and I have acquired Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of Malon, to be my wife in order to raise up the name of the deceased on his inheritance so that the name of the deceased will not be cut off. From his brothers or from the court of his birthplace, you are witnesses today. So Boaz says, I am doing what I committed to do. He, he, he just said it. I am going to raise up a descendant through Ruth. Do you see? Boaz did it whose way? God's way. The grace of Boaz. Boaz was kind to the workers in the the Lord, in his field. Boaz followed and went beyond the Lord's instructions in providing for the poor, for the foreigners. Boaz showed great compassion and generosity to Ruth, not ever expecting, and Boaz had no idea this would happen, that Ruth would come back to him someday. He, He just gave. You know, sometimes we give because we want something, right? It's easy to be kind to the people you like and the people who you look up to. It's very, it's much harder to be gracious to someone who can never do anything back for you in return. That is the kind of selflessness we must have as Christians. We must be kind to those who are the least in our society. When you come across poor people, are you gracious to them? I ask that to you as much as I ask myself. It is hard. It is very easy to be kind to people I need, business people I need favors from in the future, but people who will never be able to do anything for you. Are you like Boaz? You show generosity and kindness. Boaz um, redeemed Elimelech's legacy at his own expense. Boaz did not shortcut, but somehow followed what? God's way. So we close, the perseverance of Naomi, the sacrifice of Ruth, and the grace of Boaz. But this message would not be complete if I don't share with you the happy ending. Boaz took Ruth and and she became his wife and the Lord blessed them or enabled her to conceive and they gave birth to a son. And the women said to Naomi, blessed is the Lord who has not left you without a redeemer. So who redeemed Naomi? It's really the Lord. And and this redeemer, may his name be famous. May he also be to you a restorer of life, sustainer in your old age, for your daughter-in-law who loves you is better to you than seven sons. In the Bible time, sons are perfect. And seven is a perfect number. So the, the, the people are saying, Ruth, the foreigner is better than seven sons, better than the perfect children. It's such a compliment of God's goodness. And look at Matthew 1, 5 to 6, and you've seen this before. Salmon was the father of Boaz by who? Of Rahab. You know why Boaz is so kind to foreigners and the, the kind of person he is? His mother was what? A foreigner. His mother was a prostitute who came to Israel and was rescued when the Israelites took the promised land. So God prepared Boaz way in advance. God had Rahab there. Look at this. A prostitute was able to raise a man of God. Mothers, your impact on one life can never be, I'm struggling with the word, overstated. 
We can never talk enough about how important your impact is on one life. And Boaz was the father of Obed by Ruth, another foreigner. And Obed, the father of Jesse, the father of David. And you know it. David was a man after God's own heart. Can you see how the people in the family help raise the children that love the Lord? And the legacy continues. And then it, it leads us on uh, to the, the closing ideas that selflessness can change what? One life at a time. No, no, remember I said at the start, yes, there's the heroes that save a nation, but imagine God used Naomi to bring Ruth to him, even though she was flawed. Who's the real redeemer? God is. God used Ruth to provide for and redeem Naomi by guiding her to the right field and having Boaz on the right day. Who's the real redeemer? God is. God guide Boaz to redeem Ruth, Naomi, and the line of Elimelech. It's God. And God guided Rahab as she gave birth to Boaz and raised him well. And Boaz and Ruth had Obed, who was the grandfather of David, a man after God's own heart. One life changed at a time through selflessness. So, I close, and I, I'll take two minutes. At all of this, who is the real redeemer behind everything? God is, right? Even behind the example of our family and behind the example of Naomi, Ruth, and Boaz, God is the redeemer. And the same way that Ruth needed a redeemer, we need a redeemer. We all need someone. Uh, to save us. And we run to wealth, we run to things, we run to people, we run to family, we run to relationships. But eventually, if we look hard enough, we realize nothing's enough except God Himself. So we can come to Jesus like Ruth came to Boaz. And we can bring our need to the one who can redeem us and buy us back. It says, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace which he lavished on us. And Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law having become a curse for us. For it is written, curse is everyone who hangs on a tree. So the price Jesus paid is far greater than the price Boaz paid. Jesus gave his own life so that we could have life. So be a change maker, be selfless, persevere, be sacrificial, be gracious, and all through Jesus Christ. So let us bow our heads and close in prayer. If there's anyone here who has uh, not experience redemption. I want to say a short prayer first for that. The Bible says that we can experience Jesus as our Redeemer by believing in Him. So John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world, He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him will not perish, but have everlasting life. That is redemption. I'm going to say a prayer. If anyone wants to pray that, you can just quietly pray with me. Dear Lord, thank you that you are my redeemer. Thank you that you died on the cross for my sin. I come before you in humility, asking you to redeem me. Forgive me for my sins. Come into my life. Change me. And help me to become the person you want me to be. Thank you for your salvation. Now I pray for everyone else, Lord, help us to be a redeemer. Not to be the redeemer, but to help bring you, Lord, to those who need redemption. So Lord, will you help us to be selfless, to be change makers by, by being persevering, sacrificial, and gracious through you so that many, one life at a time, can come to know you and experience redemption because you are our redeemer. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen.